So, so one of the things I feel is that uh, people you know, have a, a need to somehow learn from nature or uh, a lot of the inferences they seem to draw from nature. Whether they know it or not, you know, whether they know anything about nature or not, uh, in, in whether you see in Tamil literature or in, in the way of speaking or, you know, so many things like we have this mythical bird which draws the milk you know, out of the, you know, the run-up or, away or, or even the fish which cleans the pond, like that, there's a lot of things, but a lot of them um, have just been frozen in time. I mean, these are things that they've been saying for centuries and and I don't know if it's just Tamil or I think any culture, no? So like one of the, I mean, I don't like to start with this, but it's but it's one of the most overused and most misused thing is the survival of the fittest. And somewhere it's used in the context of business, it's used in the context of any survival anywhere. And it has this classical thing of, you know, a predatory animal and a predated animal, you know. So a powerful lion and uh, then a timid deer or something like that. And that this is a, a relationship. No doubt it is a relationship. But this relationship somehow has uh, become bigger, has become the uh, inference from nature, okay. Uh, or the other one which I thought about is like, you know, referring to the lion as the king of the jungle. That the, that the forest has to have a king and the most powerful animal is the lion because it's predatory. Today morning I got a quote which said like, uh, when you think of courage, you don't have to think of the lion, you can also think of something else. But but we are the ones who are creating this myth of the lion as a courageous animal and other things as not courageous. All these uh, metaphors somehow uh, are along certain lines of thought. And what's interesting is uh, it has not been challenged. Though like current research or even um, different understandings have emerged over time, you know. But uh, we have stayed with this old adages, you know, and keep using them and reusing them. And so I feel it's time to shift the narrative, you know, to be a, and to reflect reality. It's not like we want to project another uh, story and therefore again draw from nature the way these people have done. You draw another story and tell it. No, but just if you base it on w what is being found and what is real, I mean, I feel there are so many I mean, narratives. I know whether you have got uh, into the fungal world, I mean, the recent findings into the world of fungi, unbelievable. So one of the new uh, terminologies that have come is a wood-wide network, wood-wide uh, wood web, www, but it's wood-wide web. That now you're sitting in a place like this, that all the trees here, and perhaps the all over in the compound or wherever are all connected by a network of uh, you know fungal myce mycelial network like you know so so often when we think of fungi we think in terms of mushroom but that's like uh, only the visible part which is uh, on the surface is like a fruit in a tree at most at most but it's not even that but the the, the part which puts out the spores and things like that you know? but otherwise its life is underground and we don't see it but that this mycelium run all over a forest or run all over even a vegetable garden like this or a fruit garden like this and that they are connecting the whole place. There, uh, even here in the early periods, uh, there have been a lot of trying to draw parallels and trying to give human, like like a business sort of <laughs> model of uh, to to this like competition collaboration we want to have want, we want to use certain phrases or uh, the, the fungi is governing the whole thing and fungi is the king of the forest <laughs> or anything like but uh, the research is showing that it's much more complex than all that it's not any one thing it's are the fungi using the plants or trees or are the trees using the fungi you know who's using who uh, where do animals come into this whole thing it turns out to be much more complex than that. But some of the very, very attractive things is they say, if any, uh, like a human enters a forest, the forest knows 
you know, something like that. That that our that that uh, our footfall generates some communication. Now, I mean, for maybe for the new people, what sort of communication is this? How does this communication happen? It may seem exotic. It may seem a bit unreal, you know, because when we think communication, we think words. We think, uh, but actually, even for us, communication is chemical. You know, our body is basically a chemical network. and so much of what we <clears throat> experience is chemically induced like like the most easily uh, uh, understandable recognizable is an adrenaline flow you know the, the flight of fight the fear you see a snake you you know you feel fear and it's a chemical rush it's an adrenaline rush but most emotions like whether it's romance or whether anything it's it's still the chemical no like uh, i mean uh, the sun the thing i feel like you know that uh, some of us uh, are fortunate enough to still be in touch with our bodies where and i think it it's true for everybody but some have lost that contact where when when you are entering a situation if uh, if you entering a room and uh, it's tense you tighten you something in your body tightens and automatically it reflects in your body nothing needs to be said you know there is a unverbal non verbal communication of tension that emanates you know, and most of us can pick this up now th- where is this i mean it's not like somebody is going in somebody is crying visibly or you just pick it up right this is a st- sort of a visual uh, and is much more than visual it, again we are a very visual species so if you see somebody looking sad okay you can say you can pick that up but even if nobody is looking sad everybody is sitting calm you still pick up the tension there is some other modes of communication and uh, you know and uh, all this is a bunch of uh, chemical uh, responses like you know sometimes stress you can almost feel some acids <laughs> seeping in your uh, ex- in a being excreted uh, in your stomach or whatever you know you can feel the juices <laughs> coming out they say like uh, plants have about uh, 700 chemicals <laughs> for communication you know so so then if you see uh, somebody is entering to a forest and then that is being passed on you know that 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 there is a entry that the footfall is there it could mean something to the forest uh, and the and the forest in some way being ready for it um i don't know how much uh, uh, to say in terms of how, how can they be ready for a human being coming to cut a forest you know but uh, maybe we can go there later but but in terms of other things i think they have by now studied uh, you know the langur story like uh, how langurs uh, chew on leaves right langurs langurs primarily are leaf eating though they eat bark and insects and root and all that they are primarily leaf eating monkeys right so when they go and chew on the leaves uh, the tree which is being chewed Uh, you know the, the from the leaves we have uh, chemicals going out you know and that when it goes downwind other other trees are picking up that scent and they know that the tree is under attack the tree is under attack by possibly langurs mostly and then they get their defenses up ready which 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 often translates into bringing their you know toxins alkaloids whatever to the edge of the leaves or to the leaves or whatever mostly to the edge of the leaves because that's where the chewing starts and so when the langur picks up a neighboring tree's leaf and chews it's bitter <laughs> so this communication has happened but what is understood is that langurs never eat downwind they know this has happened this communication has gone already so they always <laughs> go eating up and now so in this game the langurs are little bit up like you know so recently they were talking about uh, some research of you know com- uh, sh- uh, they tried a few like in the caterpillar season a few days before the caterpillars actually came on to play the sound of caterpillars munching to the tree will it respond <laughs> you know because it's a major attack like so will they get ready and they found they are getting ready <laughs> like you know but if you do it completely on another season it is not going to they are not getting fooled but if you do it in the time that uh, you know that it happens so there are uh, this kind of communication this is understandable you know you that it's uh, that a leaf has been eaten partially eaten and then there are some uh, the juices are going in the air like you know and that can be picked up by other things so they don't so for us like you know these are these are 
uh, non-moving, for a human being who is such a moving species, to look at a tree like this and think of it as a alive, sentient being is impossible. And they don't have a nervous system the way we do. So if anything doesn't have a nervous system the way we do, then it can't be responding to pain or pleasure the way we do. But that's, all this is focused on understanding the world through the lens of how we function. But then there is a, that the way we function is how humans function. And maybe you can extend it to greater ape functioning, or maybe to all the primates functioning, and maybe to mammals functioning. But even that, there is a lot of difference. And then what about all the other species and how they function, you know? And, uh, and mammals itself has gone off too wide because it also includes bats and includes uh, elephants and they have a totally uh, different communication and so uh, that, that looking at everything through our lens and through our parameters and through our way of understanding and trying to gauge if they are uh, intelligent or if they are uh, uh, feeling or do they have this or that, you know. All this has uh, taken us uh, really astray. So going back to, first I'll finish off this fungal business. So, so interesting things they find is that in a forest, you know, uh, the trees, they are connecting, they are, their root. So uh, again, another fascinating find. Before the trees and plants developed complex root systems, the fungi functioned as the root system. So roots development came later. So the early, early plants, if you see, they didn't have a very complex vascular system, phloem, xylem and all that, they are very, very simple, right? They didn't have a complex root system either. So the fungi acted as the root system. But today the plants and trees have roots, but the, all roots would end with fungi. Like if you start digging from the under the supporter tree and going, it will keep getting thinner and thinner and then getting this, you know, you will get to this white part, you know, very vascular tissue. And then beyond that, it's still going on, the network still goes on and that network will be the fungal network and that is interconnected. And so they are finding things like if one part of the forest lacks in a certain uh, nutrient, and the fungi are able to draw it from some other part of the forest and give it, you know. And why would a fungi do it? Why would it support, uh, you know, why would it uh, try and balance out a whole ecosystem? Or is it managing the ecosystem? You know, I mean, it's obviously not thinking. <laughs> like, so what is going on there? I mean, there's lots to be found. It's not like one has all the answers. but. It's in, it's in the interest of the fungi to keep the trees alive because they are interconnected. You know, it's in the interest of trees to keep the fungi thriving because they are dependent, like, you know. So, if, with this example, my main point is that uh, uh, more than competition, it's collaboration. You know, that this is something, uh, it's surprising that we didn't catch this, but the, if you see the, what one can learn from nature, Biggest learning is that cooperation, collaboration is is essential to life. Okay, so without this, there is. So we look at some visible <laughs> example of a lion running after a deer, and then say, oh, that strong lion or strong tiger, uh, you know, is uh, the powerful one in the forest. And but predators die more from hunger, you know, than uh, deer. The the, the more uh, uh, if you see who, whose life is more at peace, it's the deer. The deer constantly is chewing food, so very happy, <laughs> you know. The only time of threat is when something is be when it's being chased. And that time also, if you are young and white and you're able to run around, you won't get caught. So the very young and the very old are the only ones. So you're not even really threatened by a predator. So you're at, your life is largely at peace. Whereas the lion has to, uh, you know, outrun, which it can't do. The you know, lions can't run so fast, so they have to have major strategies and then, you know, and your nine out of ten times you fail, you're living in constant hunger, and you know, it's not a very peaceful life, and yet you say, that's the lion, you know, that's the king, <laughs> the king should be living a happier life, if you ask me, like, you know. Uh, so, I mean, uh, so, so, so somewhere we pick up some visible things, and, uh, but, uh, Talking about, uh, then when you come to, so actually if you see relationships, we do have, what do we have? We have symbiosis, uh, <laughs> so mutualism is one thing, then we have predation, you know, then we have, I forgot the correct word for the second one. Wait, no, no. <laughs> coalition is another fascinating topic, we'll come to coalition in a, in a bit. 
you know, basic game. <laughs> so, no, there are, huh? Natural the collaboration. That's right. There are three types of relationship. So, one is the whole mutual benefit. The predation is very important. Then, the moon is parasitism. The moon in nature is very, very widely prevalent. Like, parasitism is not just one odd thing. Like, it's such a complex thing. But, uh, so, a lot of importance has been given to one aspect, which is, uh, it's called antagonism. Okay. So, uh, like, a antagonistic relationship. So, one benefits at the cost of the other. That's antagonism. So, if a uh, lion were to survive, it kills the deer. Like, but, but whereas a symbiosis and mutualism is where either both are benefiting or at least one is benefiting, the other is not harmed. Mm. And the third is parasitism, which obviously and the, the host is not very happy. But it's in the interest of the parasite not to kill the host. Mm. So, not always are they killing also. So, often, uh, we, we, I mean, no, all major organisms will have some minor organisms, lots of minor organisms. Like recently, I was watching one uh, video which says, you see a gaur or a bison, and you see one animal. It's actually a whole forest. It's actually, because if you see on the skin or ticks and this, that and all that, you know, internally they have all kinds of tapeworms and this, that and all. And they have in, uh, in the whole digestive system, they have a whole bunch of bacteria and you know, and uh, then they have these oxpeckers and this, that, which the birds which live on, or drongos if you go locally. I mean, that one <laughs> animal is supporting a whole forest of other animals. But because we are so used to size, you know, Something big we recognize, something small we don't recognize, but there's lots of small there, like, you know. And without that, the, without the bacteria, that uh, bison can't live. You know, digesting cellulose is considered the toughest thing in the world, okay. And all cellulose-based animals have to have gut flora, uh, bacteria. So you have to take the leaves, mash it up keep it in your thing and then the bacteria have to act so the re-chewing all simply so that they can be acted upon by bacteria so that's why when we take antibiotics our stomachs are bad then they ask us to take a probiotics without bacteria even our digestion won't happen and the most amazing thing is for even something as cockroaches which are again which plant eating thing the first for their survival the first thing that needs to happen with the young ones is that they have to have gut flora fixed in them so the mother makes her excreta available. So the first starting is, uh, uh, you know, excreta. Right? And I was just watching an interview saying, now they are finding uh, for humans uh, using fecal matter from healthy human to fix gut flora in a person for whom it's not working well. But uh, animals and plants and like I've seen a video in which a hippos, uh, the baby food is mother's uh, fecal matter. Because the mother nicely has chewed it, added all the healthy bacteria and made it into a digestible form. And that is the, for us, we can't think culturally, oh man, oh my God, like, you know. But again, it's a very human uh, perception, but, <laughs> well, it's the... Uh, new thing is the crap pill. Uh, a crap pill, isn't it? Uh, that's what I was saying, like, the fixing the, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> very interesting, like, you know. So, so the whole cooperation matter, then one can think of, a, you know, so the fungi doing this. But uh, that's something new. But known to us, there's lots, you know, like pollination uh, without, uh, they say when the bees disappear, our crops disappear, you know. I mean, imagine then how they're making robo bees uh, to go and uh, do pollination. They're trying to, because if bees are going at the rate, we are going because of pesticide uh, invention. I mean, increased use of uh, pesticide. And so there are no bees and <laughs> they have to make bees which will go and it's a complex job. But the bees are doing it for free for us, like, you know, or all the pollinators. The other one also, in, in terms of communication, when we say uh, chemical 700, this, that and all that, it's not like uh, it's an alien world to us because we love the smell of flowers, you know. That's a chemical communication. The flower, the flower is communicating to, actually, we, we are not the, uh, you know, targeted uh, species. They are communicating to bees and uh, other things to come and pollinate them, right? I mean, but we are also attracted. And we are able to, it's, uh, though it's not intended for us, we are receiving that signal saying, oh, take me, <laughs> something like that, right? So the, the world of chemical communication, uh, you know, I mean, uh, initially may sound a bit alien if you're not used to it, but actually it's, it's the most uh, common, you know? Um, 
so yeah so there so basically uh, for me if we are looking at nature then you know as a then i would say we have to understand it better and if you understand it better you see how much more is dependent on uh, uh, living together working together and and then if you go into mutualism and this that and all the amount of being together uh, very 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 fascinating so then again like you know my recent uh, thing where i no the other slight movement for me has been that uh, uh, as somebody who was engaged in trying to understand nature by observing by reading by this that and all that uh, coming to a point where uh, one realizes and it's a lovely point for me we really don't know <laughs> okay the most recent is uh, like i think 25 years back i read this book the soul of the ant so this man uh, eugen marais had spent 10 years studying termites right and and termites as being fascinating beings and this that and all that and i was uh, reasonably uh, impressed and blown away and all but uh, now after 25 years again uh, looking about uh, them reading about them watching them uh, perform uh, doing various things some days you hear like a uh, pitter patter like raindrops falling and there's, there's no raindrops and then you realize they're doing that they're tapping on the ground why are they tapping on the ground all termites are hitting the ground with the with their bellies i don't know what's happening but uh, all, pretty much all of us have observed this okay so some communication is going on there anyway so most recently i was watching a david attenborough video where in, where in south africa he is south, uh, south africa yeah south africa he shows a uh, this is a termite uh, which is uh, like towering like several meters high but below like if all of us uh, would know if you study termites that they are the first air conditioning in the world so inside is always temperature maintained the first bore wells in the world the first arches in the world the, uh, one of the early farming i don't know if ants did first or termites did first the farming in the world fungal mushroom growing in the world now there are first uh, first bore, bore well i said i know so many many things like that but how do they keep the temperature control below they have this uh, veins okay so they are circular veins yes. abhi ring 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 like that it goes like that and each of them are these veins are very 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 thin narrow long structures okay mm. made out of mud and uh, it's and it's able to and the way it's arranged it has uh, you know sluices going all the way to the top it's circulating air so it uh, draws in fresh air it cools it down and then it passes it through that to the to the main chamber itself and therefore controls temperature but this vein is so complex the whole design is so complex and they are built by termites who are blind so individual termites know how to come and place that little soil particle mixed with its saliva in the right place to get this amazing geometric designs you know perfect designs and in australia they have this magnetic termites they say like they are absolutely oriented uh, uh, by the magnetic field okay uh, and they are like a knife edge start slightly broad and then it gets very narrow because the midday sun is so hot they shouldn't get it at all so the top is like a knife edge but as in the daytime it can get the more uh, you know, uh, milder sun and uh, the reason they are like this is because the area gets inundated so they can't normally if it's too hot they can go underground in the during the day they will go underground but here they can't under, can't go underground because it's inundated so they'll all have to come on top and if it gets too hot they have the thinnest skin membrane they will just get cooked so they have to have it perfect temperature so everything is oriented so perfectly and uh, all this by blind termites you know and how do, how does such a design happen how do how do they know exactly this geometric you know, we have a whole vision they don't have a whole vision they don't have a vision at all <laughs> so they have a mental vision how do they do this the thing is the answer is we don't know you know and i feel that's a great place to uh, be like you know because we somehow have have this notion that we have figured out this and we have figured out that and this arrogance coming from having figured out the, the the point is that we actually have figured out very little you know we are very good at uh, mechanically fixing things but uh, organically understanding how processes work we have not even figured out our own minds or how to relate <laughs> and you know between ourselves 
Yeah, you know, after being around for hundreds of thousands of years, we still, on an everyday basis, don't know how to engage with each other, you know, in the most uh, amiable fashion. So there is lots that we don't know, understand in terms of process. So for me, as an educator, to for, to bring young people, to bring anybody to the point of realizing that what we know is so little, that we don't know, to accept that we don't know. I think it's one of the most three most difficult words, even as a teacher, when somebody asks something, to say, I don't know, is not easy. But I would say that's a great place to start. To start by saying, I really don't know, and I possibly won't know. The people who have spent, you know, 30, 40, 50 years uh, studying specific things, after that realize what oh, they know so little that they haven't even begun the process of comprehension. Yet we casually you know, gain some uh, random bits of knowledge and, and then think we have figured out something. But generally as a place to start, you know, that's something uh, uh, I'm very keen about. So, yeah. So that is one. The other one I was thinking is how to bring about. So as I'm all this in the context of uh, we are trying to create a climate change curriculum, and realizing what are the core issues. You know, yeah. what are the core, as a in terms of education, what do we want to take across, take across? So we have kind of distilled it down to uh, four or five things. So one is to uh, to see how human centered our, uh, you know, everything is the perception of the world, the perception of other living organisms, uh, all that. So maybe I'll just first talk about that, uh, that, uh, that somehow, you know, nowhere has it come about that this is a shared planet, this is a shared home, that this is not just a home for humans, and that is a, that we have a, a obligation, a moral obligation, a shared sense of responsibility with other living beings is not there. So conveniently, I think, I don't know if it's a right quote, but from Bible often it's drawn like everything was made for you, like, you know, for man to enjoy. You know, all these creations were made for us. <laughs> I don't know if even if it's a right reading, I'm not at the Bible, so I don't know. But this is conveniently often said, you know, and that all of this, uh, or a couple of years back, one of my classmates was saying, this is our time in the planet, you know, and dinosaurs have had the time and now it's human time and now we are the, as the most dominant species enjoying everything. But does enjoying mean destroying it for, for even for our own kind for posterity or what? Like, you know, so this whole human centered view of the world makes us do things which uh, are so, I don't know what the word is, I mean, you know, it's so, uh, you know, against the feeling of sacredness. And I don't know if humans always live with like this, because if you look at indigenous communities, if you look at the tribal cultures, if you, you know, across the world, there is a much different uh, connection, you know, like uh, very often you hear about Native Americans calling the eagle the brother or the river the sister or, you know, there is a sense of uh, being one, you know, and even in our own uh, uh, cultures and all that, very much seeing the forest as a, uh, as a living space, as a sacred space, that, and we are all co-inhabitants of the same space. That always that feeling of sacred. I feel that the feeling of sacred has gone. See, feeling of sacred for a thriving living space. We create this monoliths and you know, and then go there and say, here is sacred, but there is religion, but not sacred. You know, you can create a religious aura around a place, but true sacred means pro-life, you know, where life thrives. That you will, when you go into a forest, I think even the most uh, uh, not, you know, the person who's not used to such a thing would feel that sense of awe, like, you know. And, but, uh, and I, I, in fact, I quite often have that experience of being in a forest and somebody who's come for the first time still feeling that sen sense of veneration for the place, you know. But in our own lives, in the way we live lives, in the way in a city or in, my, in front of my computer, I'm disconnected to all this. And then I make decisions which are, uh, completely antithetical to, to this uh, feeling, you know. So, <laughs> like, uh, uh, I think a few years ago, see, uh, I, I, see I was born into a completely uh, non-vegetarian community. I mean, I, I became vegetarian because I became sensitive to animals at some point, and then I became vegan. Then, <laughs> then I stopped taking white sugar. Then I just going like this, like this at one point of time. 
uh, I hit, it hit me like a ton of bricks that the biscuit is one of the most violent <laughs> products because it came from uh, palm oil and palm oil is generated by destroying uh, rainforests in Indonesia and this like that and all that. And so when you when, uh, when you are eating a biscuit, are you thinking of the orangutan or something like that? Or at some point in time there was a Nutella craze, like you know, and then uh, they they nicely <laughs> put positioned it. No, I think something is coming. We may have to take a little break. <laughs> so that eating Nutella, you are actually destroying what is now that our lives are so embedded in complex, and we are removed from that you know you don't realize that uh, uh, you know uh, such a commonplace decision like going to a ma um, shop and buying a product you are actually responsible for something like that but this is unreal no this is these are systems we have created which uh, if the, the person who is uh, while buying would have cognizance of the fact that this is resulting in that they won't buy it we won't buy it but yet the it's so removed that we are able to make these decisions easily it's not like one, uh, I mean, life itself is dependent on life. But then there's a way of taking life which is sacred. No, 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 everybody should become vegetarian for life. But like the Native Americans, when they took uh, life, there was a sense of like, today I'm eating you, tomorrow I will be eaten. You know, so thank you for giving your life to us. I can sustain my life. This is a very common prayer. Like, you know, and I see it in among other, there is no wanton killing or destruction, all of that, all that. This is all that, Katala. Um, so, so yeah, <laughs> where did I come to this palm, palm, palm oil? No, but yet we have uh, completely uh, acted on one level without uh, this obligation for the rest of the living beings, wiped out all that. Then the next step is like uh, this whole uh, uh, factory farming, you know, which is, I mean, uh, we have we we suffer a lot when we hear about rural uh, we'll, we will take a break. so in terms of uh, uh, you know should i take up uh, the topic of uh, intelligence i'll do it in bits okay so in the topic of intelligence uh, so no so humans are the most intelligent assumption right then there are the, to some extent we can accept apes, we are similar to apes, you know, it's been proven over and over again, so we accept uh, apes. Then, uh, hey, you keep going, I'm, actually I'll cover all this ground, but uh, the most astounding creature, the octopus <laughs> and, the, and the squid and all that. So while talking about communication, the squids communicate through color, so their bodies are like this shape, right? <laughs> the amazing thing is, if two squids are like this, there are three squids in a row, okay, one, two, three, this squid is communicating something to this and something to this, okay. Half of the body is giving out love signs to the female squid this side and to the male squid this side, I'm angry with you, is giving out uh, angry signals. So the body exactly is split into two colors and it's, co it's changing by the microsecond. So it can so much complex patterns of dots and lines and colors and whatnot, amazing uh, minute by minute by minute communication going on like that. It's, I mean, how do they even produce that, you know, that kind of complex things like, you know, and multiple communications at the same time. So, you know, octopus can do crazy stuff, you know. So one of the things they found out, I'm, I'm coming uh, this story a bit reverse. So octopus, octopi know how to open bottles. So you put, you put them inside a bottle, inside a bottle, and screw the thing. They know how to unscrew. <laughs> okay? So in the Houdini Act, so they can, uh, so they have this, like sucker pads, no? So they can fix the sucker pad on, on the, under the thing and turn it and come out. And so they found, oh my God, how do they figure out how to open? And they come out so fast, it seems, you know, <laughs> that they're fascinated. So then they said, suppose you put the food inside, right? and lock the bottle, will they open it? Thing? And they didn't bother at all. You put a, one of its favorite food, crayfish or something like that, inside a bottle and leave it in near the octopus. Right? They were not opening and eating. So they said, oh, it's able to think out of the box 
when in a stress situation, but uh, it's not, it doesn't think like that when it comes to, this is the conclusion drawn by some researchers. So the point here being made by the person who I was reading was saying that invariably, it's not the, it's the question that's wrong. The inference itself is wrong. So somebody else said, again, we are thinking in terms of a visual species. We are a visual species. So octopi sees prey inside a bottle, so it will try to read it. But are octopi dependent on visual cues or are they dependent on something else? They said, okay, let's try uh, olfactory senses. So took some fish oil and smeared it on the outside of the bottle. Next second, it opened and ate the... <laughs> because so they, they perceive the world through smell. Okay, so this is a dramatic example. The point that actually was being made is, it's a brilliant point made by a German uh, ethologist long back saying that every animal has what is called its umwelt. It's a German uh, word. It says its own perceived felt world. So every animal perceives the world through its senses. Okay. So their world is very different from our perception of the world. So a tree, you, the way we see a tree, a woodpecker wouldn't see a tree, or a, you know, or a raccoon which is living in a hole in a tree wouldn't see a tree, or something which is burrowing inside, or, or a, a, you know, a, a wood boring beetle. They all would perceive the same organism in their own, through their own perception. So the point is to how to uh, get to try and get to their mind and understand the world, not see it through, are they able to do this, are they able to do that, are they intelligent? No, all the questions are human, <laughs> through the human parameters. But the minute you sense that this is not their world, that theirs is a different world, and try and understand the world, then suddenly everything changes. So, so there's a recent book by Franz D. Wall, who is a primatologist, who's, the book is called, Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? <laughs> so the question is not whether animals are smart. The thing is, how he is smart enough to know they are smart? And through that, he says a bunch of stuff. Like, so one example which uh, long back has come into the thing is like, so one man long back, a man called Nagel, wrote a book saying, uh, how does a uh, bat, uh, uh, how does it feel to be a bat? And he concludes by saying, we, we will never know. <laughs> because we, know, we don't know what a bat world is. While that is true, later another researcher called Donald uh, Griffin uh, discovered that bats use echolocation. Okay, now that something like a, a comp as complex as echolocation, today all of us know, we have studied it, so we know, accept it as a fact. But actually when you think about it, echolocation is a complex, uh, uh, you know, science. It's uh, something very difficult to understand and uh, use. And at that time, Human beings were just discovering it in Second World War and all that, and they were beginning to use radar and stuff like that. So when Donald Griffin suggested that uh, bats use it, the scientist community just exploded, saying, are you mad? This is latest cutting technology which human beings are just discovering. Are you suggesting, <laughs> how can bats, you know, some primitive uh, thing, have it? But the answer is that they have, <laughs> they have it. Echolocation is being used. Now, a bat doesn't sees the world through the sounds that it puts out. Can we even figure out what that means? So how it how its world looks like, you know? And how it is able to sense little, little flying insects at what speed it's flying and, you know, and and are there other bats also? You, know, you have to have your own understanding, you know, of the whole world, all through the world of sounds. If you just think about it, it's so complex. And how do we judge uh, whether a bat is intelligent enough or not? A bat is intelligent enough to live its life the way it wants to, the way it is meant to be. You know, so each animal is uh, is designed and tuned to live its life in the most, uh, you know, uh, efficient way, you know. And uh, so this the very question is wrong, you know, are animals smart or not smart is not the question. You know, f to understand how each animal has functioned is the thing. So, like, often uh, people ask me, as a person working with turtles, uh, are turtles, uh, like, uh, what kind of creatures are they? Means they are very unresponsive to humans, you know. But why should they be responsive to humans? Like, you know, uh, I mean, if you watch a nesting turtle, it comes and does its own thing and goes. Like, you know, I mean, if you go the oh baby, or <laughs> stroke it out, it doesn't smile back at you, all, you know. But, and they seem very uh, like, like this whole uh, Descartian vision, you know, they're very automatic. 
They are very just instinct driven creatures. They come, they dig a hole, they lay their eggs and go off. Okay, it's a, it's one perception. I mean, not only a wrong perception, but if you see a, if you see a turtle world, how a turtle lives, you know, how, what does it do in its lifetime? They live similar to us, our life uh, life spans, and in that lifespan, how much they travel. How they are able to identify that one small piece of island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So today they are, you know, there is one whole bunch of uh, uh, tradition people saying that uh, Tamil people figured out, uh, you know, uh, sea migration, you know, migratory routes and uh, sea or sea travel through fo by following turtles. Now whether that's true or not, turtles know how to navigate. <laughs> you know, turtles know how to find their feeding ground, how to find their nesting ground and if you, once you go into the ocean, everything looks the same. No? Without a compass, we won't be able to move at all and, he, and they have something which tells them how to get to that one piece which is 2000 kilometers from any mainland. So they don't think in terms of land, they live in a world of sea. For them, they don't have to have reference of land. No? They have a, their own reference. But how do they get there? The most amazing discovery recently, which as a turtle person I didn't know all these years, is that uh, hawksbill turtles, which are always considered the most beautiful turtles because of their pattern, apparently they glow under ultraviolet light. So uh, for uh, organisms which see through ultraviolet light, they are a positively glowing turtle. They glow. So why would turtles glow? And in the same article said, Pat platypus, right? Dugbill platypus. We have always known Dugbill platypus is a very strange creature, like in Australia, living in a very neither a mammal nor a they, all that. But again, they found that the fur actually glows blue and uh, yellow under ultraviolet light. So how? So the thing is, we see something with our own uh, visual spectrum. We hear something through our audio audiovisual ability and perceive a world and say that's how the world is. But platypus is not what we see. You know, uh, uh, animals which use UV light see a glowing organism, like you know, and uh, and now that are they're finding plants which glow, you know, insects which glow, and all kinds of glow. You know, this is phosphorescence and bioluminescence and all that. So, w what is the purpose of all that, and how does how did that how does that influence the, the way they live life? How are they using that ability? Like, you know, so some uh, deep sea fish actually use light like we do, like using a torch light, you know, like the angler fish has a uh, thing on top of their head, which like a torch light, which can switch on and switch off. That we understand. Oh, it's because it's using it like us. But there are a whole bunch of them which use light very differently. And so, so what is their perceived world, you know? So that's, uh, again, something quite... Uh, Extraordinary. I'll take a pause. Wait. <laughs> uh. So the, the actually in the whole book, this is what he is primarily saying that if we want to understand about an animal or a plant or whatever, you study it. You understand what its life is like. What are its challenges? Who are its predators? Who are its prey? Who are its collaborators? You know, and what is the relationship with all this? And this is something we are just beginning to scratch because we barely understand the whole network of uh, relationships that such a thing uh, each animal has. La. So <laughs> recent, uh, not recently, but um, a plant uh, scientist uh, Tim Plowman, uh, the genius he was. Uh, so he was asked about. Uh, no, I believe plants respond to music, you know, uh, they say when you play Mozart, it, <laughs> it, it grows faster or something like that. Then he said, the plant, a plant is the only organism which can eat sunlight and grow. It also has to listen to Mozart. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, isn't it enough that, that they do something as magical as that which we can't even imagine? And then you also want them to listen to music that you listen to. or They may or may not do, that's a different matter. But why is it that we want them to be doing these extraordinary things which we think <laughs> are, you know, a sense of aesthetic or this or that or whatever. So I found that quote uh, quite something like, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. Right. So we'll, we'll uh, go back to, yeah. So so what uh, the if you see in the last um, uh, 
so so Descartes said what he said and went. I think, therefore, I am. Actually, in his own time, this was challenged, you know, by people. But uh, he was a quite uh, a philosopher, uh, a towering figure. So somewhere it got accepted. Um, but uh, that is not the mainstay of thinking. So Darwin didn't believe that. Uh, like Darwin, as an evolutionary biologist, believed that everything evolved, right? So the, if we have a human eye today, which is a complex one, there were stages from which it came. In fact, the human eye is not the most complex one. In the, I mean, if you see the most amazing eye in the world, it's the squid. The giant squid which lives in the ocean has an eye which is one foot diameter. Okay, and uh, what it sees, or, or if you see the bird's eye, which you can see through four spectrums of light, we can see only three. So, I mean, you know, our eye is amazing, but there are also other eyes which are amazing, but it has evolved over time. So, if you find a human brain which is extraordinary ability, that, all, that didn't come from nowhere. Suddenly, here is one species, we'll give extraordinary ability. It must have evolved. So, you know, so cognition, like everything else, Evolved is the point, right? No? So, he, Darwin very much believed that whatever we have, other animals also have. Okay. So, but somewhere at some point of time after Darwin's time, like one guy called Skinner, you all would have studied, uh, he spoke in terms of, uh, you know, stimuli response. Like, you know, so all animals are just, you know, this SR, SR thing only, like you give them a stimulus, they'll respond. You know, that they are not really feeling, thinking beings. That, you know, any animal could be trained to do whatever, you know, by a series of like that, uh, you give food, like this Pablo kind of thing and all, no? if you give food and, you know, you ring a bell, then you just ring a bell, they start salivating, the Pablo's example like that. There was a whole bunch of things that they said, he, he brought it down to just stimulate response and he wouldn't accept that anything more is possible, that, uh, that they cannot be a... Uh, intention, they cannot uh, plan for a, uh, you know, for a future that, you know, that animals just are in an ever-present state. You know, all this is completely untrue for anybody who has lived with animals, you know, that it's not, you know, that they are never trapped in one ever-present, you know, it's not true. And then over time, almost everything that was stated has been proven wrong. But interestingly, every time these people prove something, then they up the <laughs> thing for human, whatever. So, like for example, tool making. So, man the tool maker. And then it has proven that uh, chimpanzees make tools. You know, they, they actually break a piece of uh, thing and dip it into the termite uh, hole and fish for termite. <laughs> okay. So, they are using tools. And they said, oh, okay, but primates, you know, whatever. Then mm, that took some time to accept. But uh, there we have, we have come to a point where they accept it. Then they found crows which uh, <laughs> break off twigs or find twigs and dig out uh, wood boring beetle grubs, particularly New Caledonian crows. Okay, and they carry their favorite tool around. <laughs> okay, so uh, crows are doing it, and then uh, sea otters do that. They pick up these uh, you know crustaceans and they keep them on their chest and break them. You know, so. Slowly, slowly, you're finding that more and more and more. So tool making is, tool, tool using is not the one. From tool using, it became tool making. And um, so accidentally picking up something and using is not, to, uh, it's only tool usage, it's not tool man, man is a tool maker. But that again uh, has been proven in a complex of uh, one recent video I was watching, where a crow is made to reach, a, uh, is offered a challenge of reaching a piece of meat which is hidden only if it follows a sequential nine-step operation. This video is very much available, okay? So it has to, uh, you know, pick up a one small uh, twig which is hanging somewhere. With that, it has to dig out one stone, another stone, another stone, and put it on a balance, which will release a large stick from which it can go like this. It does it all. So, you know, it's able to follow sequence. It's able to say, if I, to get that, I need to use all these tools. <laughs> yeah, then they then this, this scrub jays, you know, they're like crow like birds, you know. So apparently they store their seeds, you know, for future consumption. And they, so they'll dig it, bury it, and they have a visual map of where they are burying the thing. And then all, not all the food that they bury 
is uh, of the same uh, perishability quotient, you know, some may spoil faster, some may be a piece of bread which has to be eaten within a day. So the, the mental map includes, uh, you know, which will spoil when by which I, had, I need to eat, okay. So this is future planning, no, this is planning for the, so it's not ever present. So they are storing for future, then <laughs> they go one step further and find some of these scrub jays tend to steal from others. So not all scrub jays. So the ones which steal, you know what they do? They know that other scrub jays, since they steal, others also may steal. So when they are burying, if they see another scrub jay looking, they will continue burying it. And then after, after that bird is left, they will change the place. <laughs> okay. So this addresses another major thing saying theory of mind, that only human beings can perceive what somebody else is thinking. That animals don't have that. So if this <laughs> bird, is thinking, okay, that bird has seen me do it, and therefore, you know, I should be uh, cautious. That's the theory of mind for a bird. And the classical thing is that bird-brained means you have almost no brain. And here is a bird, you know, <laughs> doing this. Like, you know, I'm, I'm giving one example of theory of mind. So all the things that have been said, no, the the tool you say, uh, theory of mind, there are many, many more than that. Okay. All of them have been uh, proven to be, uh, uh, no, it's not true, like it's not, and, but each time they prove, there's another challenge, but it's okay, but this, uh, now in the last 20, 30 years, we are beginning to understand that, uh, that, you know, the, the, the simple vision that we had is not true. So, when talking about uh, mental maps, like elephants, right, like the matriarch is the oldest female, right, so she, and they, elephants migrate thousands of kilometers, right. So she has a visual map of the water holes, the areas of danger where humans might, uh, uh, you know, shoot them or attack them. And they're saying the older the matriarch, the better leader she is because uh, her ability to, her experience is more than all the others. So 50 years back, there might have been a drought. At that time, this is the only place which had water. So to go to find that you need the matriarch's uh, knowledge mm -hmm. and then it, she has to be so confident that she's taking them off the path for about 20 kilometers and they are already parched mm -hmm. and you go there and there is no water then they'll die mm -hmm. but yet she's the leader and she's taking that responsibility and doing it and all the changes that keep happening over this period of you know dams which are being built or whatever, whatever you know all the all this is built into a in the elephant's head like you know at least fortunately, we always have thought that elephants have a good memory, but the memory will serve a purpose of survival itself in this complex thing, okay? Then they found some amazing stuff. Can, do, can elephants recognize individual human beings? So, for example, they live among Maasai, and they also live among, among other uh, tribes, which are, and I've forgotten the names of which, oh, oh, other African tribes. They can recognize uh, a Maasai from a non-Maasai. Maasai frightened them today because Maasai earlier used to worship elephants. They consider them God's cows and uh, so well, had veneration. But now that their land is being shrunk and they know that the governments are trying to protect elephants, their way of hitting back at the government is to kill an elephant every time they are. Something bad is done to them, they get back at uh, the humanity by uh, killing an elephant out of. So now the elephants have really learned to fear Maasai. So they, what they do is, they play Maasai language on a loudspeaker, the elephants all bunch up together and are showing stress. But most fascinating, if you show Maasai red cloth, they get scared. Okay, so color, language, but if you play a Maasai woman's voice, they don't get scared. Because they know Maasai men only. So they're able to recognize in another species whether it's a male or a female who's talking, you know. Mm. You know so this is all mind perception. You know, how can you call this a mindless, you know? So, so on and so forth. Like, it goes on like that, you know. Then, of course, another, uh, for self-awareness, they said self-recognition, you know. For a long time, scientific community wouldn't accept that, that they could see a mirror image of themselves and recognize it as themselves, you know. That is a, considered a very human thing. But today, the number of species which can are recognized, now you, you, you have dogs like cats, they don't recognize themselves and they, they don't show signs of recognizing any way. But interesting thing even about dogs, they are sitting in front of the mirror and probably growling at, the, at their image. But if you come within the same uh, visual spectrum, they'll wag the tail at you.
And you notice that they'll be looking in the mirror, and from behind they're seeing our image. They're able to see it's a reflection of us. And you can signal to them this and all. But themselves, they don't seem to recognize. It's very strange. How are they able to, or they, maybe they recognize, but they're not showing any sign. But uh, how they did this test initially is you, you, they anesthetized the chimpanzees, put a, some marker on their head, and then uh, put a mirror in front of them. Okay. And when they went, and they will go check that out. They're looking at it in the mirror because they can't see this. Some I hear, right? So they were, they were doing it like that. And now they find they don't need to do such funny things now because chimpanzees regularly go and see <laughs> see the dental things or see some patch here, bend forward and see. Whatever they can't see, they are regularly doing it. So chimpanzees now have uh, self-recognition, which is also translated into self-awareness. Then uh, once chimpanzees now when they said other animals, they said elephants don't have self-recognition. They don't seem to. So one uh, bright guy asked, how big is the uh, mirror you used for elephants? <laughs> and they had used some uh, two feet by three feet or whatever. He says, you had to put an elephant size mirror and see. So they put a 10 foot by 10 feet <laughs> mirror. Initially, they're going looking behind it and all. And then they saw it's them. And they can recognize. Elephants can very well recognize. But the, the wrong question was to put a small mirror and expect them to see only their faces <laughs> or whatever, right? So once you put the elephant size mirror, they recognize. And now the latest is scrub jays can recognize themselves. <laughs> okay. So every test you take, first you think it's creatures similar to us, like fellow apes. <laughs> and then it goes and goes and goes and it goes down to mollusks and <laughs> birds and mollusks and fish and, <laughs> you know, fish recognize apparently, <laughs> certain kinds of fish at least recognize. So all these things which we considered very uniquely human are turning out to be not so... I, to, I know there's this one video of David Attenborough where this, this, this fish that actually does a piece of art uh -huh. in the sea floor, the pattern. Yeah, I'm not saying it. It's an amazing pattern. Okay. And there's no particular reason for why the pattern is being created. Okay, like, there's okay. There's no mating, nothing. Oh, so, okay, so, okay. It just creates yeah. these patterns. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. fish can. So there's another thing, no? Where yeah, yeah. You know, animals and human beings are different because uh, human beings can create art. Right, right. And Wait, but but if you see bower bird, you know, you know about bower birds, right? So I think there's some ten or eleven species of bower bird, maybe more. All of them have a fixation of some color. You know, they build these complex yeah. structures and they festoon it with colors, no? so blue. And nowadays they're using blue plastic, blue uh, bottle cap, if it's blue. Or if it, no, they use feathers, they use seeds. They, and some birds do this on an everyday basis. You, they'll clear the forest floor and decorate it with the various leaf shapes. The next day, they'll, no, not next day actually, uh, some of them do it every day. Some, what they do is, each leaf as it's beginning to grow old, they'll take it off and replace it with a fresh leaf and create this uh, pattern. Oh, art, yes, there is quite a bit actually like that in terms of, uh, you know, using pa complex patterns for, uh, you know, for various uh, uh, their life processes. But yeah. Mm. Younger than self awareness, self recognition, theory of mind. Mm. Ah, two, three other things like uh, one is competitiveness, empathy, <laughs> you know, this they did to. Uh, uh, these videos are available, huh? all these are available as uh, short videos. I mean, I can give you the links and all that. Like uh, capuchins, no? they are small monkeys, like, you know, so capuchin, what they were doing is, they had to do one small test, and so in response, they'll give them a, a treat, <laughs> okay? So initially, they're giving them both uh, something, no? They're giving them, uh, what do you call it? Valdrika? Cucumber, they're giving cucumber slices. Then they gave one of them a grape, and they gave another one a cucumber. This one got very angry, threw the cucumber back at <laughs> the saying, how come that person is getting a grape and getting a cucumber? So, <laughs> you know, equality, fairness, you cannot be unfair. Okay, this has been taken several steps more. So, if you give a lot to one and don't give to the other, this goes and gives it to the other. You know? Or if, suppose, and it goes it's much more complex than that. Suppose secretly you feed one, okay? The other one doesn't know. And this one is full, and but this only one is being given. It one doesn't know that has not eaten. So it will go give it. 
But suppose it sees it being fed, then you go give this one, you have already eaten, so I won't give you. Okay, so the sense of fairness, all this is, is a moral evaluation, no? Very much they have. Oh, there's one amazing story, okay. So, among chimpanzees, there's all this hierarchy and all that, right? So, they, if uh, they do, what they do is on low ranking male, hmm, they, all the others are inside a, a room, but only the low ranking male is seeing, they hide a apple in their play area. In one of those, there's a tire. Inside the tire, they keep a apple and they release all the chimpanzees. They won't know what he will do. He's a young male, okay? So he goes and uh, he walks past the tire without showing any sign that he has <laughs> seen anything, okay? And they all go to thing and they're all doing their own activity. Some 10, 15 minutes later, he comes back quietly, takes the apple <laughs> and eats it up. So he didn't go straight away grab because he knows if I grab, then somebody else <laughs> will notice, like, you know? So he did this, okay? So this is quite showing that, you know, perceiving how, what should I do? It's strategy, you know? Then they also placed a bunch of uh, uh, fruits. Uh, they buried it underground, okay? Um, a whole crate. And then they kept the empty crate there. So the fruits have gone somewhere in the room. One chimpanzee saw it, but kept running as though nothing happened, you know? <laughs> but had seen the place. Then again, when they all slept, he <laughs> came back and ate the fruit, <laughs> okay, very peacefully. <laughs> but interesting, uh, five years later, uh, some other bunch of researchers came and said, we want to do the same uh, trial again, okay. And uh, by the time this young male had become the alpha male. So if you put the thing there, he'll go straight, <laughs> grab him because he is not bothered about uh, somebody else <laughs> thing and all that. So they had to choose some other female. So they chose a low ranking female. And uh, but this time they didn't put it in the tire, they hid it somewhere else and they released. And then uh, after some 15, she did the same thing. She checked on it, went off, some 15, 20 minutes later, walked back to pick it up and he saw her. And he says, I know this game. And he went to the tire to see if there was an apple for him. <laughs> okay, so cute because <laughs> this is a game I have played before. They have played with me before, five years, Later, he's still able to remember that they kept it for me in a tire. So maybe there's an apple for me there. <laughs> okay. So this whole uh, here and the now and that they are there only now and that they are ever present and they don't have a memory of the past or this and that is such nonsense. Like, you know. So along these lines, just uh, one more uh, major story is uh, orcas. So people have studied orcas for 50, 60 years. And there again, the matriarch is the grandmother or a mother. Apparently, sons don't leave the mothers in that case. And elephants, the after some time, adolescent males leave and go off. But whereas in orcas, they live together. Sons and mothers and daughters all live together. And if a mother, if a son is separated from the mother, his life longevity is reduced dramatically. And they live for 60 years, 40 years, 40, 50 years together, um, together. So the mother will be 60, son will be 40, you know, the huge organisms, right? big guys. They all live together, <laughs> together. And this orcas as a family group are looking out for themselves. So this researchers are saying very clearly this education of the young ones. So, uh, so educating the young ones uh, inadvertently can happen in some species. Like they are, like chimpanzees are known to uh, collect stones right? to break these rocks. So part of the year they depend on depend on a certain uh, uh, kernel of uh, of you know certain fruits and all that because for them it's a protein uh, supplement. So they learn to they have a factory <laughs> factory site where they will go and uh, uh, pound away and thing. And the young ones it takes them about five years to figure out how not to smash their own thumb and how to use the right size stones to break and get to the kernel. Now, but they're not actually educating them. They're actually, they're observing and learning. Whereas orcas, they actually set up, set them up and teach how to hunt, how to, you know, how to uh, dislodge a seal or, you know, all the, or how to, the uh, main thing they teach them is how to beach themselves because getting out of water is not a natural thing. Like, but whereas if you want to get to a seal, and seals are often sitting on the... Mm -hmm. You need to get there and then get back by a certain action. Mm -hmm. So they actually apparently practice in non-seal beach, uh, non beaches and or better slopes. Mm -hmm. 
So the mother will go and show, then she'll get the young one to do. If it gets stuck, it'll push it back. So they actually educate and then they'll go try uh, on seal beaches and so on and so forth. I mean, so you know, this complex family structure, you know, relationship, that after all this thing, how are we able to, you know, kill them by the million and tree in this factory farms, like, you know, and not understand that you are causing so much suffering. Which is what I left off earlier, which is basically that, you know, we remember human wars and action, you know, violence against humans with such uh, suffering, you know, like we look back at the Holocaust or Mao or Stalin or whatever, we suffer. But uh, we are doing this on an everyday basis to animals without any sign that, that, they, that they are, uh, you know, intelligent being, that they are, you know, that they are, uh, uh, what shall we say, living, thinking, feeling beings, you know. So, again, they're like, so cows, are they really thinking, living, feeling beings? And very much so. I mean, as somebody who lives with cows, I can tell you that they have individual personalities and they have uh, very, very clear uh, signs of uh, bonding and all that, no? But I don't know if you've seen the Kruger National Park uh, video, uh, there's an eight-minute <laughs> video, amazing video of, like, you know, a bunch of uh, cape buffaloes are walking and the lions are lying in ambush, so they don't see them. And when they see, they start running, but a calf gets caught. They manage to push a calf off, off the herd into a water, and they trap it. Okay, and so they have three or four lions have all caught it, and the calf is still, still slightly the size of the lion, so it's still struggling and all that, and kind of falls into the water. And after some time, you realize a crocodile has grabbed it. So a crocodile is pulling it from one end. Three lions are pulling it from the other end. There's a tug of war going. And you're like, you know, your heart bleeds for the thing. And then into the vision come 30 buffaloes. They have come back. Initially, they ran, right? They all come back and rescue the calf. The calf is still alive. They throw the lions away and take the calf and go. Like, this is an eight and a half minute video. And some tourists who are there on this side of the bank accidentally shot it. It's amazing how they come and they corner the lions, physically throw them away. And recently, I was uh, wanting to show it to somebody, I showed, and then <laughs> funnily, 10 years, ap 10 years later, the same thing happens, except in the same place, except that this is not a calf, it's an adult which has gotten caught, again there are lions, again there is a crocodile, and the whole herd comes back. So this whole thing of, you know, we look out for our kind, and we'll take on, so the courageous lion <laughs> versus the, you know, uh, dumb buffalo, <laughs> whatever the buffaloes are, by no very, very uh, strong, courageous beings, like, you know, who look out for themselves. Or, yeah. This what? one is there. There's another one which is very moving, which is uh, uh, a wildebeest young one, yeah. which is very young, goes to kill and then realizes it's a very young one and does not kill it and then starts mothering it, starts living with it. Uh, and uh, But what can it feed? That one needs to be given milk, but it's unable to, right? <laughs> so, it just hangs around, it doesn't let any lion come near it. This one doesn't eat, drink water, nothing because it's protecting it. I think five, six, seven days later or whatever, it gets very tired in a moment when it moves, a, a lion comes and kills, another lion comes and kills it. Mm -hmm. But for five, six days, it actually mothered a wildebeest, a young one. Oh, like this also in nature, there are quite a few stories of a sudden uh, bonding. And uh, in Gujarat, there was a story of a, uh, leopard which would come out of the forest every day to come and sit with the cow. And the cow would keep licking it and the leopard would, the, the uh, photographs, video and all available. Then the villagers got very scared and started th frightening the leopard and wouldn't let it come. But actually a cow <laughs> and a leopard had bonded. So across species are their bondings? Very much so. Symbiosis shows lots. Uh, what I have visually seen is very interesting is like uh, when we go to Gurukula Botanical Sanctuary Lab, we have these mixed hunting parties. You must have heard of them. So birds often gather into a large group, which are apparently in America, North America, a bunch of birds through winter hang around together. Okay, because uh, food is scarce. Different species. Different species. Food is scarce and being together, their chances are better. So they actually live through winter together. But here, this is a, these parties are created and dissolved, created and dissolved. And over years, we realize the party is being called for by two species only. A racket-tailed rongo calls out to a, a, a flameback woodpecker, or a flameback woodpecker calls. These are the first two guys who start the party. 
and then their racket and their calling and the amount of noise they're making draws other species. Okay, seen I, the biggest I've seen is 80 species actually. Okay, 300 birds in one place. Can you imagine? Like you know, but that's was only once in my life. But frequently I see 20, 30 species uh, together, some uh, hundred birds. And they're all feeding on different things, but they are creating such a racket and a flutter that insects are, you know, in a tizzy and they are panicking and becoming easy meal to them. So several times a day, these parties come together. So often when I'm going bird watching and like, you know, for a long time, you don't see or hear a single bird. And then you hear there's some action somewhere. You go there, and you're in the middle of that action. So it's very deliberate, planned, uh, you know. Though they don't keep staying together, but they get together like that. So species, so they say a moray eel and a particular fish. I've forgotten which fish now. They partner together. The fish, as it goes hunting, you look for a moray eel and say, come, let's go together. Because one can reach a spot which the other one can't. And then, you know, so they... The moray eel can go and dislodge something which is sitting inside and, and they share food. <laughs> okay. And how much they are friends, we don't know. <laughs> but uh, the partnership works together. So like this is a whole bunch of, uh, uh, you know, uh, symbiotic, not by living off each other, not like lichen and all that, but actually behaviorally sharing space. That, in, uh, the other one is uh, uh, in India, like, you know, we say langurs and um, spotted deer are often seen together. Langurs are sitting on top of the tree and they have a aerial vision of the, the for safety. The langurs are on the ground, they have sharp ears, so they're looking out for tigers. So common calling patterns, you know, like, oh, I see a tiger or there's a tiger on the prowl. So and langurs' uh, uh, alarm bark is recognized by a lot of species. But so one is calling out for a common predator. The other one is uh, langurs are sort of picky, funny eaters, you know, they'll, uh, they'll eat a little bit of a fruit and throw it. And deer can never reach fruit on top of the <laughs> tree, no. So they are, uh, so they, they'll follow langurs. Spotted deer constantly follow langurs for one uh, getting fruit from top of a tree and another for, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting a safety, <laughs> safety signal. Uh, this a lot of collaboration is there, behavioral collaboration, like, you know, so that is another fascinating area. <sighs> We'll take a break. <laughs>
normally places of abundant uh, rainfall, you know. So there's plenty of resource, they can grow luxuriously, they can grow big and they can spend as they, as they wish, you know. But here it's not like that. So it's a limited rainfall, a limited time of the year and it's not an abundant resource and yet they have chosen to be evergreen like you know how did that I mean chosen means that's what has evolved so how did that happen and what are the features so normally I put it as a question and answer with the students and all that so various things they have done you know? one is that the whatever features are ideal for this condition there are only 30 major species of trees there's, lot, there's about 400 shrubs but the trees if you see are only in 30 species all of them have evolved with the same features which will suit that condition, which is they have a small leaf, they have a dark green leaf to reflect off sunlight or to absorb sunlight, you know, to you know, not be uh, 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 affected by it, with a layer of wax coating, okay, with reduced pores all on the bottom or whatever, pores are always on the bottom, but uh, thick wax coating, dark green leaves and very small and growing very close together. Okay. So what they are doing is they are creating a microclimate. Actually I have experienced this, you go inside it is about 4 degrees cooler. Okay. And they are all grown close clusters. Uh, I am sure there are more features, I am just saying a few like this, like you know. All co-evolved to meet the same condition. But then there is something interesting that's happened. After some time two of the trees emerged out of this. They changed the pattern. So they are called emergent species. So two of them did not stay with the bunch. <laughs> they grew taller and they, they, but the minute you grow taller, you are facing a stronger wind, you know, you are not one with the bunch, you know. So for them, uh, they have to prevent transpiration loss by being able to, because they are taller, okay. So they, they put out hairy leaves. So because the, the hairy breaks the wind, you know, and breaks the transpiration loss. So the emergent species don't have leaves like the rest of them do. They have a, a different kind of a, a leaf from this. So, I mean, it's unbelievable. Like when you see in nature what's happening, it's constantly in a state of flux now. I mean, we are catching it in our human time in one thing and then you're able to see something. So there again, one more example was like uh, when we went to uh, Bhima Shankar Reserve in Maharashtra, I was very surprised to see lot of uh, uh, leaves with a hole in the center, <laughs> okay. Small leaves, but perfectly circular hole in the center, nothing else. Like, I was like, what is this? Like, you know, but fortunately, the person who took us was a researcher from that area, Rennie Borges, uh, she's a professor in uh, you know, IAC now. And she, she had been studying the giant squirrels and she said, oh, these are the giant squirrels who have done this. Why, if you ask, in the, in the arms race, what has happened is, because the, uh, these squirrels are eating the leaves, the plants have uh, focused their you know, toxins at the edge of the leaf. Because normally a, leaf, a squirrel will take and start biting from the edge, right? So, they have, so the squirrel has combated it by folding the leaf, eating the center and leaving the <laughs> edges. <laughs> and this is one particular species of tree called the Mimicillon, okay? So right now in the arms race, the, tree, uh, the squirrel seems to be one up. But the tree will evolve <laughs> a response to this, which we or may, not, may or may not see in our uh, human lifetime. But this kind of arms race is going on among species all the time. Like, you know, that uh, I discover something, <laughs> the predator discovers something. So there was, for a long time it is concerned, no? like this, they say uh, metatarsal femur ratio. Like this bone versus this bone, right? So f between, um, uh, you know, ungulates, and predator species, every time the ratio change for the ungulates, uh, it will also change for the uh, predators, because these are increasing speed. They are making the, this metatarsal shorter and making the femur longer, which gave them more strength and speed. And so over evolutionary time, you see, it kept getting, at one point, it looked like, okay, this is not the strategy to follow. You can't just outrun them, use stealth instead use some, some other weapon. So at that point of time, the metatarsal femur ratio of predators stopped changing. 
and they resorted to uh, grouping like lions, how they gang up together, or or uh, you know uh, leopards uh, crouch and stealth, use stealth and all that. But for a long time, this ratio was changing in response to each other. So this kind of called a arms race, you know. The other one is this whole area of mimicry, you know. <laughs> so butterfly mimicry. So there will be one species which is poisonous, and there'll be something else which <laughs> mimics the. Uh, poisonous one. Like uh, here, the most common example we have here is uh, the common Mormon butterfly, which uh, mimics the you know the uh, crimson rose, common rose. Like you know the some the female male some, sometimes is confusing like for us. And if you see the caterpillars, they mimic the the uh, caterpillars of the also the caterpillars mimic. It's not just the butterfly which mimics. So you're clearly giving out a sign <laughs> like you know I'm like that one, so don't eat me kind of thing. So there, there again, depending on who discovered this mullerian and Bethesian mimicry, one is all poisonous butterflies take on same patterns, so which is brightly colored, you know, like orange or something like that, which is very noticeable. So we are all dangerous, don't eat. Which is uh, actually they are not cheating; <laughs> they are giving a clear signal. In the other case, you know, <laughs> mullerian and Bethesian. Okay, in the other one. Actually, it's quite edible. It's not poisonous at all, but it's taking on the colors of the other one saying, I'm also not poisonous. <laughs> I'm also poisonous. Don't eat me. Like, you know. Uh, but how do these things evolve? Like, you know, I mean, uh, uh, and that way, Darwin was a genius because when he, he was able to foresee these connections. Okay, so the, um, there's a story of how he, this, uh, you know, this uh, deadly nightshade they call that, I forgot, the Datura. No, with a long flower, right? I mean, he saw it. When he saw it, he said, I'm sure there is a, a bird, you know, with a, a probe and tongue so long to reach that they said, don't be ridiculous. They cannot be anything. A, a moth or a bird, he said. And much after his time, it was discovered, I think it was a moth which had a nicely curved thing. Which it could unfurl and reach there, like you know, so that if uh, this bird, that that uh, birds and, and pollinators and you know the plants co-evolve to match each other, to suit each other's uh, things, like so there are uh, wasp mimicking you know, orchids, you no, know? like you look like a female wasp, and the male wasp comes and tries mating with it, and then suddenly you get thrown on the po <laughs> pollen on your head. All kinds of uh, stuff is going on in nature. How did these things evolve together? The thing is, it's very difficult to figure out. How can a plant figure out that if, and not just shape, it's also smell. You look like a female wasp, you smell like a female wasp, you get a male wasp to come and try and grab you and in the process uh, do pollin pollination. Quite something like that. So, coevolution is a very topic. <laughs> what and all has uh, happened in that area? Just uh, unfathomable, but thing is like interesting to know that it didn't happen. So all evolution happened together. Is you no know, that is the interesting thing. I mean, it's not like individually these things happened. But so much of it is interconnected. Is the clear one there? <laughs> so, uh, so when we are looking at uh, climate change. It's climate change worldwide, okay? So, there is no place where the impact is not felt. Only thing, are we reading the science clearly? You know? Now, in a temperate sort of place, uh, you know, it's become warm, warmer. Now, for us, we were always a warm place. So, warm, warmer, hot, <laughs> it's very difficult to, you know, so, uh, so we need to have, uh, you know, it's not, for us, it's not as dramatic as ice melting somewhere. Like in, a, in the if we go to clo close to Arctic, there used to be these ice breaking ships, you know, to go and break the ice so that other ships could go. There's no need for ice breaking ships. There's no ice there. So in the polar region, we have fresh water through the year. You know, migratory birds which would leave are not leaving. So these are all very dramatic. So do we have such dramatic signs here? Because we are talking about warming, and we are living in a hot tropical <laughs> climate. So. Uh, more uh, that we have a hotter summer that we all visibly feel it is not good enough. You know, summer was hot, now it has become hotter. You now, is that a clear enough sign that this is uh, uh, climate change? You know, it's difficult to say. You know, so I think for a region like an equatorial region like ours, close to the equator type of region, 
there are many more cues and uh, it needs to be documented because what's happening is uh, every change gets uh, either denied or uh, put under climate change. So like groundwater depletion is a very specific phenomenon to do with the way we are engaged, have engaged with groundwater. So like moving from open wells to bore wells to digging deeper and deeper, getting free electricity, you know, and emptying out the water table had nothing to do with climate change. You know, that it is uh, that uh, we have dropped groundwater dramatically due to these po policy changes. The, you know, like having one wet crop a year to having three wet crops a year, like, you know, rice itself all through the year, is a social change. It's the way we, have, we are engaging with food. That has caused depletion. So what? So our relationship with water, groundwater has changed. So this I would separate. But uh, if you look at uh, uh, monsoon, if you look at uh, you know like uh, yeah, just if you look at monsoon, always unpredictable. Okay, monsoon was never a hundred percent predictable thing. But look at the changes. So one thing they say is uh, drastic weather events. So worldwide, you see the how many floods are there, how many uh, dry times are there like you know so more than Tamil Nadu Kerala has a very interesting thing so like sanctuary with whom we have a relationship with Guru Club Botanical Sanctuary their rainfall has dropped by nearly one third over the last 20-25 years okay but after that there's not been a further drop okay it's pretty much the same but what's happening is they would get that 4500 5000 millimeters they would get over five six months and if you count the number of rainy days over which it happens, it will be spread. Now they are almost getting the same quantum of rain, but not on that window. It's coming bunched up together. It's coming over a very dramatic few days of... Mm. So there's still the same quantum. So if you look at, if you just look at the quantum of rain, it may not look very different. Mm. But what you need to look at is, you know, you have to look at rainy days, you have to look at how the spread is. So some ways I feel it's more nuanced looking. So even in Tamil Nadu, you know, the number of, uh, uh, you know, like if you see the rainy days, the number of uh, heavy rain days, mm -hmm. the, you know, the periods of non-rain during the monsoon period, there are changes in pattern. So it may not be in your face kind of change, but it's nuanced change. So, but here I feel uh, one is very close looking at rainfall patterns, okay. The other one is there are many other cues, okay, like... Uh, if you look at uh, all across the world, for us also, it's very much there for us. Look at when are trees flowering, you know, uh, you know uh, when are birds migrating, you know, when, are, when all the natural biological cycles connected to rain and this and all, when are they happening? If you observe this, unfortunately, we don't have enough base data. It's not something that we have been uh, gathering over time to compare and see and all that. But people are beginning to notice, for example, like this uh, laburnum flower, right? It's called Vishukani. It's supposed to flower just before Vishu. That's why it's called Vishukani. But now you're finding the flowering is uh, happening in a completely unconnected season. You know, that is a cultural aspect, so you're able to immediately cue onto it. But there are many, many changes like that. You know, uh, the, the, the shola tree, so uh, shola trees in uh, Uti are showing uh, uh, much more mortality. Okay, they are in a wet area, they are in a mountain, uh, you know, above high altitude wet area, but they are showing uh, in increased mortality. Or something that I don't know how much study has happened on this, but increasingly in the last 10, 15 years I'm seeing neem trees, drying, the tops of neem trees drying out. Some are saying it's a disease, some are saying it's something else. Neem trees are actually an evergreen species. You know, I'm the same in the sense, they don't drop all the leaves at one time. They'll keep dropping through the year, but through summer, if you see, they'll retain their green. But now, increasingly, you have things. So there are, you know, to, so there are uh, there is there is a group called Season Watch, so which is trying to record a seasonal change. You know, so when did this happen, and when did this happen? So when did the, this particular tree flower? When did this particular tree fruit? When did this particular you know bird come here? When did this happen with that? So if you start gathering this data over time period, you know, we are having more and more uh, interesting observations. So this is uh, now the whole, some exciting things are happening, you know, so this whole citizen science initiative. 
that more and more people, even if it's a small number, uh, more and more people are interested in, uh, uh, even as a fad, are interested in observing. So big cameras are coming out, people are buying this uh, expensive stuff, and they are recording more and more. Uh, maybe we are recording more than before, and, uh, but we are inter observing interesting things. So just a couple of uh, weeks back, there was this uh, article of, about uh, butterflies uh, observation in this year. So a species which was known to be uh, like a bit endemic to near Maharashtra, actually near Bangalore, was seen in Aravali Hills. <laughs> okay, maybe there were strays in Aravali all along. The thing is, that's why we don't have baseline data. But it's interesting that it was observed all the way there. So Blue Mormon, which is a butterfly of the Western Ghats, was seen in Patna. Mm. Here, I've seen strays, one or two. This year, we must have seen hundreds of Blue Mormon butterfly in Thirunamalai. So I, I have been doing, you now for the past five years, week by week, I, I record butterflies. You know, because it's not all coming at the same time. So I have now five-year data, like, you know, but uh, more and more people are beginning to gather. So, like, you know, the, the first, like, uh, no, last week, a uh, Eurasian cuckoo came, okay, you know, it's a bird which comes all the way from Europe, like, you know, and uh, this is only the second time you're seeing it, uh, but when we start having more people participating, the students participating in this, then we have a bigger data of what's happening and like, you know, what changes are happening, when are they happening, you know, uh, in terms of trees, in terms of uh, migrations, in terms of local uh, uh, species. And to be able to separate our actions, what, uh, you know, what are happening locally through our own actions. So talking about palm trees, I mean, Tamil Nadu is a land of palm trees, but so fast it has disappeared. It is primarily due to the construction industry using it up for brick, brick, uh, you know, kiln making. They primarily use palm tree wood. Okay, so much has gone. So much is going. Locally, I can see loads, lorry loads of palm trees disappearing. Okay, if you go on the highway and see how many palm, uh, you will definitely see a few lorries of, you know, palm tree wood. Like, you know, now this is, our local action, like, you know, and uh, we are uh, some, uh, I don't remember, Tishangur, I think, is known as the uh, uh, borewell capital of the country. From there, borewells are going up to Kashmir. You know, there are hundreds of companies are there which are always, uh, thousands are there which are always going all over digging. And people, there is no uh, limit on how much you can dig. In, in fact, Chennai was the first city to draw a law saying you can't go beyond 27 feet. But nobody followed it. But, uh, you know, 1,000 feet. They are going to 1,000 feet. This is like, uh, this crazy. Because it's not so expensive. You know, so you are able to do that. So, every, so recently one uh, person known to me, in one plot, dug five borewells. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is all, this is all angst, this is new age uh, thinking, you know. Anxiety, I need to secure it for myself. So, so both are happening. One is uh, in a worldwide pattern, there are changes happening, which are due to human action on a global level. And then there is this very specific local things, uh, changes in the way we, uh, you know, uh, move about, the way we grow our food, the way we build buildings, all those changes which are causing local uh, phenomena. And uh, so there are also some people saying, let's not put everything under this one bracket of climate change because it's not particularly helpful. So to delineate and see which is which and, and take action. I don't know if we'll take action, but at least to be able to be clear to say. So like this Tamil Nadu weatherman, no, Pradeep, he keeps saying, You know, you know, the climate change. No? Always there are times when there are more rains and there are less rains. No? But, but on the other hand, how many extreme weather events are happening in one year? That's a, if you globally, if you count and see, that's a very different one. It is quite dramatic. The number of typhoons or cyclones or super cyclones. I mean, super cyclone is not something that you, why it's called a super cyclone? Because it's, the magnitude is so high, an occasional phenomenon. But today, the frequency of super cyclones is much higher. So very clearly there are uh, uh, patterns, you know. And uh, the other one very interesting, last thing I'll say is uh, a migration of, Tree species, okay. So ones which are growing in a certain uh, temperature belt, that where it is growing has become too hot for it. So it's moving northwards. So there's a northward migration of species. Whole forests 
you know, uh, how are forests moving? Because seed dispersal. It, if what seed falls here, one germinate here, it will germinate. In. So they are observing internationally that whole forests are moving north. So whole species are moving north. Northward migration is going on in terms of uh, northern hemisphere. In southern hemisphere, it will be a southward migration. So there are many major global phenomena and there are local phenomena. The more people are involved, but only thing, uh, my only point here is that it has to be more nuanced and uh, carefully recorded over time to be able to see. The catch there is not having enough, uh, enough baseline data, but even if you start now and keep generating, and if it enters into people's consciousness that things are changing due to our action, they may respond differently. As of now, it's so out there. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a Western world's problem or some inter global problem which I'm not connected to at all. It's not true. Like for a place like ours, uh, summers have become quite something else, you know. And uh, like for an afforestation group like ours, for us, if there is no summer rainfall, the previous year's planting is completely waste, okay. Because we are not watering out trees, we can't water, if you're planting over thousands and hundreds of acres, you can't go water on the hill and all that. So, it's carefully timed planting, you know. And uh, the biggest uh, determination of uh, success is the summer rain. And normally there will be rains in March, April, May, at least some showers will be there. If that doesn't come, you know, then it's done for. Your 15,000, 20,000 trees that you planted have all gone, you know. But this, so our li life work has become so precarious, you know or the groundwater, or the farming. So earlier farmers, like, you know, okay, Adi, now, now is the time to plant. You know, and you commit to growing rice, you can't do that. Because if you commit, then if the rains don't come, you are not able to come complete your crop. So, so like, our farm in charge, Parsaman, is always trying to gauge between, uh, but if you can't wait till the, you know, we have the well, water well full <laughs> to plant, then you miss the, all the rains have gone waste, you know. So you have to take a chance. So this time, he sort of committed for four patches and then uh, let the seedlings go for, half the seedlings we let it go. I mean, we tried giving it to others or let it go, let the cows eat it because it was too much over commitment. So finally, we have stuck to growing in less than one third of the area of what we normally grow. Because that, otherwise the value water will completely go. So I'm trying to grow rice. You know, this is a very, uh, and if you just see how much rice we have grown over each year in the last 10 years, we have a data set. So having authentic data collection and response is the thing I feel to bring into uh, local consciousness, which I feel is uh, not there now. Now it's not uh, enough to people, to, they don't really understand that here is a global phenomenon in our midst and how it is impacting our lives is not uh, understood, not in a perceived way. I mean, you can read about it in the paper or something, but they have to perceive it, they have to sense it, like they have to feel it. And it's there, but that, there's a gap still between perception and uh, what's out there. Like uh, That should change. I think it can change. We are on the cusp of that, uh, bringing that about. Yeah. India was a major shipbuilding uh, thing till the British banned it, saying you Indians can't. Build, we will only build the ships. Like they did, they restricted uh, textile, uh, the muslin, gisselin, uh, the mari shipbuilding. We were making seaworthy, we, uh, Indians were making seaworthy ships for a long, long time because the trade has been going on for such a long time. Um, but uh, now they said no, no, no. This is our thing. So they could randomly make rules now. <laughs> So they, rest, they prevented Indians from making ships or even plying ships. And the wow, see, he, he actually said, I will run a shipping company. Eventually <laughs> he ran. No, but the thing is like, so shipbuilding, shipmaking, wherever there was huge money to be made, they would restrict uh, Indians from doing it. So this whole other perspective now is that, you know, that one perspective that uh, Indians are so technologically backward, you know, that uh, we owe it to the British to have brought us technology. So they say British brought the railways, British brought the modern shipping, or British brought the uh, you know, postal services, telegraph services, so on and so forth. It's actually not true. All these things were happening at that time in the planet that, in, that, that Indians were not capable of keeping in, uh, keeping in, in uh, touch with whatever was going on is a, a rubbish perspective. We were not allowed to keep in touch. So the, so the, the very interesting thing is like the, during the Mughal rule, you know, India uh, apparently had 25% of the world's economy, you know, in the share. 
by the time the British left, it had come to less than 2%. <laughs> okay. So that is because of restriction of uh, 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 Indian uh, you know, uh, functioning you know, independently, you know, doing business independently. So they were been doing it for. So Indians would have kept pace. No, because we did have the very good shipbuilding skills, we had very good uh, textile skills, we had a whole bunch of skills. But that the was. Mode also changed, no, with coal and. Uh, correct, but all these changes were happening parallelly. internationally, and they had a way of uh, spreading a lot. Knowledge spreads, no, and, and how knowledge is shared and that is a big thing, no. So uh, restricting knowledge spreading. And then, you know, but the thing is that this perspective is largely held by Indians, that we owe it to the British for having given us this whole thing, which is really sad. So that actually brings me to my next main speaking also. People keep talking about a collapse that's going to happen, you know, or that we are heading towards a collapse. The thing is that we are deep into the collapse. The collapse started at least 200 years back. Like with the Industrial Revolution, the collapse process started, okay. And, uh, uh, but Industrial Revolution escalated it. Even Industrial Revolution is not the uh, main cause. The main, uh, if, if you see, if you take it step by step and all that, I would say the most uh, impactful change was the colonialism. That, that, that whole colonial process changed the face of the world, environmentally, socially, you know, in terms of every aspect, you know, that was the biggest uh, negative thing that has happened. So to look at the whole, every single thing, if you look at it, you look at tradition, culture, environment, whatever, whatever, that post Columbus, 1492 onwards, that, that's America, but everywhere in the world, you know, the shipping came, technology came, and what happened to the rest of the world and how some seven or ten countries, uh, you know, what is it, parasitized the rest of the world is the story actually. So by, uh, if you see, but, but uh, uh, like there's a beautiful book called The Unnatural History of the Sea, hmm? where he says, uh, uh, like the Industrial Revolution was the last uh, nail on the coffin. It was not uh, the, the first, you know, it was, they, they managed to escalate the whole thing. But actually the processes of, uh, you know, taking in that way, you know, resource grabbing had started even earlier. So he says like the ocean, ocean fishing in a major way only began actually in uh, uh, 1080. Okay, before that uh, largely in, in the river fishing or coastal fishing, but making seaworthy vessels to go into the sea and fish had actually started around 1080. And by 1300 or so, you know, 200, 300 years, around the European waters they had decimated lots, they had uh, decimated populations and uh, then when America was discovered, they began to yeah. fish around America. They talk about going to in America, they would drop a spear and get three fish, it seems like. You know, there, are, there are paintings of that period showing oh, so thick and then in a couple of hundred years, they managed to finish America. And then they began to spread us to the world and then there was whales and there were seals, there were turtles. They chased them to the corners of the world. You know, there was no hiding place for anything. By by late 1800s, beginning of 1900s, 90% of the ocean was finished. Even by then, like you know. So when you now when people who come on these turtle walks now ask me, and so oh, you're releasing so many turtle hatchlings. Won't it uh, affect the balance? Mm -hmm. What balance are you talking about? Balance went, <laughs> you know. Centuries ago, decades ago, like, you know, I mean, uh, various levels of collapse. So, like, certain desirable fish stock just disappeared, like, you know, uh, sharks, for instance. You know, that there are, t till today, that there are sharks, or that there are turtles is a miracle. So, people don't understand that this collapse is, that we are way, 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 way into the collapse. So, my, like, normally I ask these uh, people who come there, you know, how much forest cover do you think is left in the world? Or how much forest cover is left in India? And people mostly don't know or they'll rely on a textbook answer, what they would have studied in, in, in some school thing. They'll say 25%, uh, 20%. It sounds so nice, like, you know, but it's not true at all, like, you know. And when I actually tell them a figure, then they're like, really, really, <laughs> like, you know, because in terms of actually protected area, it's less than 5%. All the national parks and sanctuaries in India put together is less than 5%. And that has been managed for about 150 years, you know, or longer. When British called something as reserve forest, they meant reserve for British use. 
you know, that we will go and uh, tap it. Indigenous people can't use it, other Indians can't use it, but we will go and tap into it. So whether you're making railway sleepers or you're exporting it or whatever you're doing. So these have been, so as I was saying, they, they, clear, they would clear cut a useless jungle and plant it with desirable species. And when Indian government, uh, when India became independent, the Indian government continued on the same policy till uh, this Godavarmar Pillai Act, okay. So, so even if you see Indian forests, what people go and see as forests <laughs> are actually plantations. So you go to Mudumalai, which is one of our best kept forests, there'll be some four or five species. There'll be teak, there'll be all the terminalias, you know, like very, very select rosewood, very select species. And then what's more, then they will go on to dis, uh, cut off the undergrowth so because when people come, they want to see uh, animals. So undergrowth doesn't help in seeing animals. So basically, devoid of undergrowth, there will be a crop of standing trees, which people think is forest. It's not forest at all. It's managed plantation. It's more like a large animal farm. <laughs> you know, that is what we think of forest. Or you go even deeper into other places and all that. Like you will see, uh, like I've been into Mukurti and all that. There they planted this uh, wattle, you know, a certain kind of acacia, which they would draw this tannin from for making, uh, for uh, you know, for processing leather. Now, so major uh, tannic acid would come from there. So, the, so grasslands were planted with, the, uh, with this kind of uh, uh, trees. No, it's so thick. You know, in fact, the deer find it sometimes their antlers get stuck and they can't move. They die of starvation getting caught, stuck there. So densely packed. Again, for a new person who doesn't understand ecology, they will think thick forest. But it's all one species. It's a case, yeah, and it's not even native. So filled, so our natural grasslands have been taken over by acacia. And today, we want to get rid of acacia. It's pretty close to impossible. You cut it, it comes back. You burn it, it comes back. Because the seeds are there. So it's a huge process. The only way they're actually seeing it happen, it uh, dies out by over... So it's been planted too closely, and then over time, it drains out uh, water, and then natural dieback happens. And then slowly... But what's happening is, this these wattles are slowly dying out. And that is being replaced by Shola forest. Uh, Shola forests were never meant to be large. They were meant to be along river flows or stream flows and all that. And largely it would be 80-85% of grassland with some 10-15% of Shola. Now this whole battle is being replaced by Shola type forest itself, you know, which is a it's changing ecosystem. But, but, but interesting like that, uh, that but so much, uh, you know, interference has happened that to call something a virgin forest, I mean, today I don't know where it exists. Like, you know, in India, so you can say a high quality secondary forest may be in some places which, where there's not much access, road access or whatever. So, so even with this less than 5%, around 4.7%, you know, it's uh, what is protected area has been managed for a long, long time. So where is the forest, you know? I and mean, this question is put forth, it's quite uh, confounding. So where is nature left alone? Like you know, so now it comes down to a fragment here, a fragment there, a little bit here, a little bit there, and then uh, you know, from there, what? And still we are uh, tapping into it. Still we are looking at uh, India as a poor country which needs to grow and needs to tap into its resources. And whatever the four percent or three percent is there is still being uh, denotified to uh, you know uh, for mines or for some resource or the other. So at which point will we stop? Same for the rest of the world, like Bolsonaro or somebody like that, you know, trying to uh, destroy whatever is left of the Amazon. They, you know, my friend used to say, he had flown over Amazon, you fly for hours and hours in those only jungle. You know, just 20, 25 years back, today you see patches of forest in Amazon itself. Like, you know, you, there's no such thing as you flying for hours and seeing jungle kind of thing. So at which point will... We humans realize that, you know, we are plundered so much and that our lives depend on, you know, that's, it's like cutting the very thing that you're standing on, right? At which point is this consciousness going to come? So, so that is one interesting thing. But moving from there, I feel, uh, you know, that for those of us who are aware or those of us who feel for these things and those of us who are, are ready to act and do, uh, no point crying over spilt milk, no point saying, yeah, this has happened over centuries or whenever it happened, this is the state today and what can I do from here, you know? There, uh, what you, you, even if it's like clutching at straws, <laughs> you clutch at straws, even if it's the last, there's only this much left, you do whatever 
is there available to you. So, so me, like when I, uh, in the turtle work, if you see that uh, some nights, like, you know, you walk 10 days, in a, nights in a row, and you see dead turtle and dead turtle and dead turtle, and then you wonder, like, are there any turtles left alive? And then one turtle emerges, and you say, oh my God, it's still alive. It's, there are still turtles. It's a miracle. You know, that something is managing to survive all the shipping of the world and all the various forces and still <laughs> that the species is around after all these millions of years. So you grasp it and you try and save whatever is there. So you plant, and we still can plant trees and you can still do whatever you do and we keep doing it, like, you know, hoping that um, uh, at some future date either humanity's uh, consciousness changes and we act differently or we disappear as a species and <laughs> from here rebuilding will happen, you know, either of these things. Uh, no, but, but one cannot stop doing, one has to keep doing. So basically, um, if we say we need a different engagement with nature, where is it going to come from, you know? Um, it's a very interesting question, actually, and uh, because the, our mode of engagement has been of a certain kind. It's a, it's been a kind of taking from nature, you know, uh, just seeing it as a resource, you know. And uh, even when we talk about movement, we are talking about sustainable using. It's still a resource, but you use it a little bit more intelligently. But it's still a resource to be tapped into, you know. Uh, but uh, various perspectives need to change. That's you know, that seeing that forests can exist for their own sake. That is a home for some other species. It, that the forest itself is a is part of the planet, and that is not not for us to decide whether it's desirable or not desirable, or that you know that this many elephants can be there or this many trees can be there. It's not it's not our ours to call, right? No. And when when we start making these shifts. Uh, this whole, uh, you're so influenced by this uh, Western thought or the, you know, this whole modern thought that to come out of it, you know, somehow it seems very rational and intelligent, but it's neither rational nor intelligent nor, you know, uh, life affirming. Like, you know, and many, uh, to drop that and look for a different engagement, you know. So knowledge, knowledge itself has to be built differently, engagement has to be built differently. And where is this going to come from, like, you know, so, uh, so the interesting, but a lot of uh, thinking is going on in these fronts. So there's one interesting book by Wade Davis, where he says, Wayfinders, it's called. So basically saying, let's go back to the indigenous people and try and understand from their cultures, like, you know, and across the world, fortunately, they are still there. Wherever in the world you go, there are still these indigenous people, are there, and their cultures are there, and their, uh, 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 you know, what shall we say, their mind, their engagement is fantastic. Some, and they got labeled primitive at some point of time, you know, that they are, they, you know, we are, the uh, modern people are civilized and that they are primitive beings. You know? And this lens somehow has got deeply embedded, this view has got deeply embedded. But when you actually look, of, look at it, it's not so. I mean, whatever little engagement I have done, I find their thinking is so different. Right? It's very sophisticated. It's very inclusive. It's very, I mean, I, I fail to find words, but uh, it's a different mind from this mind. The mind itself, though human, is a different mind. So, in fact, there's a reading this uh, uh, Buster dispatches that Madhavan was talking about, right? Uh, that whole thing that somewhere uh, there's an engagement with the old man who was sitting in a shandy and uh, this guy asked him is this your shop he said no so how come you're sitting in that shop he said i found a space so i sat <laughs> and are you wanting to buy something he said no i'm i'm just being here you know and, and it goes on like that then for somewhere for us every act of ours is purposive directed towards something and that man that man says uh, I just came to the shandy, I just came to be, you know. And this guy is trying to understand that mind, you know. I'm not capturing it nicely, but it was so beautiful, you know, that somewhere that every act of ours doesn't need to be directed from this self to words, some target or whatever, you know. And uh, anyway, there are, I'm, I'm, I don't even think I can grasp, uh, explain that, but to, but to look towards things. So to conscious, at least I can say this, to consciously move away from this, uh, modern thought, modern, and somewhere to look at ourselves as evolved, civilized. If this is what civilized means, it's quite 
crude and ugly, <laughs> you know, but whatever is there in the indigenous cultures, in terms of engagement with other species or even among themselves, there's so much egalitarianism, you know. And here we have this civilized societies uh, so full of violence, so full of uh, strata, hierarchy, like, you know, and uh, if it's a question of men and women, we have smashed the women, and then it's, then it's a question of caste, and then it's a question of race, or it's a question of... On every front, it's, it's uh, stratified. And one in, ones below are, uh, are paying a price. So, to change the whole thing, so, you know, to look at, to look at all these things historically with a, you know, a new lens, you know, so, you know, like, you know, they're, they're talking about a whole anti-racist education, like in the West. You know, for us, it will probably translate as anti-caste, uh, you know, education. Uh, to look at things new, to, to move away from this whole notion that we are this evolved, sophisticated beings to saying, no, no, we don't know. And let us realign, let us relearn, you know. And there, this whole connection with nature business, uh, again, interesting perspective is that our minds have grown intellectually. So much of it, like, you know, even as I'm expressing it, is so verbal, you know, that we rely on the written word or the spoken word. And, and so much we live here, but how to get out of that and, and you know, experience something in a more in a different way, from a different plane. So there the perspective is that the, if the, in terms of connecting with nature, we have with us our own bodies. Our bodies are pure nature. Like, you know, our, body, our mind might have grown apart, but the body is still nature. So just to connect with our own body, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a way, in a way which you connect to the forest or whatever, and there is, it's a fascinating realm to be in touch with your own body. So uh, you will see, uh, that spending time in a natural setting, spending time in different planes, different textures, different, uh, like, you know, just being in a waterfall or in a forest or experiencing different, uh, you know, sounds and, and, the, and seeing it through the body, you know, not, not, and, and through, not just as, as a visual species, but hearing it, sensing it, and getting in touch with the body seems to be a fantastic uh, learning. And I see that a village child is so much more at ease with the body. You know, than a city child, and then you go and you see the, you see the indigenous people and the children, the ease with their bodies. You know, in terms of uh, the dexterity, all those things. I mean, so fascinating. So, so it seems like here we have this uh, thing right at you know with us. You know, the learning, the starting of the learning, new learning point. Just uh, like start, shut down your mind, or you know, put it on pause and find different ways of being, you know, so that's uh, very exciting. And for me, as a, as, a, as a feeling sort of person, you know, who I'm increasingly uh, beginning to uh, rely on it and not discount it. Not that I did much, but it's increasingly so, like, you know, that you, you know, somewhere that, you know, this is a rational response and this is a, uh, you know, less significant emotional response. No, it's not so, like, you know, that you listen to your body, you listen to your senses, like, you know. So that is uh, another one. Are you first time? I didn't say anything. No, no, body is Body is nature. Nature creation. We are not only one. But that is also a touch. Like, that is totally so, like, being in a, or like, being naked in a, in a forest stream and experiencing all the things or just experiencing different seasons la uh, uh, like a uh, air conditioned body <laughs> air conditioned okkan the body edhiyume eduthuk mudiyala so sometimes when i'm traveling with the public transport you see people coming in a air conditioned car right and the few minutes they'll probably go on air conditioned bus but the few minutes they'll be in hell apdiye suffer panuvaanga parunga ena you got used to controlling everything and everything had to be just one way and we are not able to take any adversity. That that softens the body, the mind, the, everything in a way where you know constantly you're seeking comfort at a huge cost to the planet, to oneself. You know that is. I think people are not understanding that somewhere I can control and therefore I do. And what is the outcome of that is uh, not understood at all. Like if you look at our uh, Maslamani and who's here, like you know our his ability to work, he's late fifties. You know, eight hours of physical work a day for this one job, then cycling back and forth, and then going back and doing a secondary work, and his energy and thing. I mean, you just don't see it in our modern uh, 
city being that you all constantly see headaches, this, that, and uh, yeah. No, recently I was talking to one boy from Australia saying these poor people in India are so lucky because they are working with meaning in their lives. They are working to fill their stomach. They are working. There is some very clear purpose. He says, for people like me who have lost that need for work or you know have a certain there's a level of disengagement with something very primary. You know, I go there, I work, and therefore I eat. Like you know, or therefore I live. But if I don't need to do all that, then something it becomes a there's a there's a disconnect, and then that leads to all kinds of uh, disturbances, and uh, you start. You know, you, the, the disconnect goes places, which is uh, which is where leading leading to mental illness and stuff like that. Because somewhere that you are wondering what you are doing, like you know, what is your place? Why am I doing what I am doing? And you can go off into a spin-off, like you know. So you are saying so lucky that they, you know, if, even if they have a crisis, that they are working with such a sense of purpose, like you know. So being poor is a gift. You are saying like, oh my God, <laughs> this is totally new, like you know. <laughs> So there's a recent sharing by Sapolsky. We can just actually you should mention that. So uh, Sapolsky actually he was talking about this very famous two three act. But one is that in the middle of uh, Second World War, right? Uh, there was a ceasefire just before Christmas. I know you, you know the story. So they had ordered a ceasefire for Christmas uh, sake. And uh, so two days before they had stopped, and so they had time to take the go and take the injured and this that and all that. And slowly the thing thawed, and uh, they began to uh, get more, get to know each other. And they organized a game of football, and they started playing across. <laughs> they started playing football, and they started exchanging addresses. And uh, you know, such camaraderie built up over that uh, few days that nobody wanted to fight. You know, they are people like each other, no, across the thing. And then the government had to say, forget it and go back to your trenches and shoot each other. This is an order. These people didn't want to do it. It completely changed the whole atmosphere there. Like, you know, this, common people are not asking for war. These are governments are fighting some meaningless uh, thing, you know. And so that was, uh, I mean, very touching. Just to think, like, you know, if you leave people alone, that's not what they want to be doing, you know. So who's deciding these things? The people who are deciding these things are not physically there watching this process. For them, it's just a number on the paper or a... You know, some figure like you know, it's not in the reality is what's happening in the trenches there, and those people don't want to be doing this. So strange our systems are, la. Right? there was a, again he was sharing something amazing in Vietnam War. Uh, at one stage, the U.S. soldiers were running through villages and you know, raping and destroying the villages. And so one of them was on a, in a helicopter, and he saw this happen. And he saw in, absolutely innocent villagers who had nothing to do with this being treated like this. So he went and, and the, as the soldiers were coming, he positioned himself before a village and turned the gun on them saying, if you don't stop, I'm going to shoot you. He was a US soldier on a US helicopter, you know, and he said, turn back and he protected the village. So what made him able to do that? Like, you know, as a human being, any person in that space would have that. But when you're caught within a system's thinking, you know, when you're said, this is what you should do, you should not think, then you suspend your own humanity. You are now, uh, 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 you know, a clog in one, or you're just a part of a uh, big machine, and you just have to function. It's not yours to think. That's how army is trained, right? You, you just have to take a command. Somebody else will decide for you. From that coming to a schooling system or whatever, like as a teacher you know, for 25 years, I keep telling my students, you know, if a class is not working for you, please tell. Don't sit there. Even one hour should not be wasteful. Like, you know, don't lose agency even for a moment. So there, if, it, if I'm coming and doing something that is not of uh, value to or you don't, you can't connect to it. Suppose it could just be that you can't connect to it. Even then, don't be there. Take a break. Go do something that's meaningful for you. For me, from a very young age, to foster this sense of that I'm in charge. That, you know, I'm not just part of a larger system. Like, you know, that uh, adults are not the ones who know. And they are the ones who should be taking the decisions. And, and even learning, it's not like they are coming empty and that we are filling, filling up their minds with you know, knowledge or whatever. No? That learning is co-acquired, you know. So this whole movement away from learning just as words in a page, as a concept, to learning from real situations, you know. And life is full of learning opportunities. So what 
immediately is accessible i feel is ourselves our own mind so the most exciting classes in the week is once a week the circle time okay where we just delve into ourselves and say why do we do what we do you now where does jealousy come from or what is friendship or what is love or what is whatever and we are just looking at ourselves to learn from and it's and one thing i can tell you no child wants to miss this class <laughs> okay they may take the, uh, uh, even if they sick they'll come just for this class and go because there is a, such a dynamic learning space the other one is nature around us you know and there is so much that can be learned by direct observation you know like what are the soil around us what is the rainfall pattern what are the trees around us what are the birds in our area you know and what are the crops that are growing what who are the people who are living what are they doing for a living all this knowledge is there to be learned by engaging you know and how dynamic it is and you go there and when you learn something and you go uh, what if you watch a borewell being dug you see different types of soil coming and you see water coming at certain depth or not coming that learning is not something that you need to memorize or write down you just know it you no know? what does it mean to know something as a real thing and as against learning it as a concept and saying i know about this you know about it but you don't know it you no know? so it's a very big difference and this first learning of actually knowing something empowers you you know and you have been part of the knowledge creation and that you have been that you have gone there and gathered that knowledge and it's yours now so nobody has told it to you whatever and so this uh, you know this uh, in the knowledge when this sharing it or cre- co-creating or co-learning it so co-creating i mean by saying putting together information collating it and you know like over years you see if you just study rainfall in your area or we study the bird species or the butterfly species for instance just looking at butterflies over the last 3 years for me i didn't know anything about butterflies i started, i got interested and i started observing butterflies then you just observe color patterns and you identify species then you say what do they eat you know are they are they are they particular trees and plants that they are, uh, have a relationship with then you find host species then you look at caterpillars do they are there different types of caterpillars are the eggs laid in some place are they, do the eggs look different are there patterns of that you know then abhi you know layer by layer by layer you keep finding more then there's a seasonality to it does do uh, do those seasons change you know is it connected to some other species which prey upon them you know like that you know and all this immense knowledge is right there right under our noses you know this you don't need to even in a urban setup this is that you know so you you go and acquire this knowledge and it's i mean it's a very very different engagement with the reading something about something you know the the in this aspect like often this question is asked what about in a urban setup you know the simplest thing is to grow your own food you know somewhere if the such a disconnect people don't know where the food comes from what goes into the process of uh, growing food but when you grow your own the magic that you put one little seed and it grows into a plant and it becomes a tomato plant or a brinjal plant or a lady's finger plant and you actually watch it happening this process for me so many times children are so excited i got my first lady's finger or whatever you know for them it seems like a miracle you know and it is a miracle because after all you just dropped one little blob there and these things happen no but it has to be experienced i mean no point uh, talking about it no so that like a uh, urban gardening rooftop gardening rooftop uh, planting and you know uh, looking at host species planting a certain plant which butterfly uh, attract butterflies and then see what happens or whatever whatever there's a whole bunch of so i feel to move away from the current learning to a direct engagement with oneself with the, with the with the text what is being learned and the very process of uh, this education a classroom setup i feel is one of the most interesting so t- like krishna modi talks about right getting off the pedestal a teacher is not the guy who's come to fill this like you know so he is also a co learner so how do how do i participate in this learning process along with the children and where do i position myself there do children get to decide what they want to learn how they want to learn how they want to engage and all these things today are far more relevant because today you want to know anything you tap a button you get it so this whole old method of saying all this knowledge is there in these books you learn all these things then you can go function in the world has become redundant you know that's not relevant anymore like you know knowledge can be tapped in any time what is imp- what is interesting is learning to learn is learning to function in a complex society learning to interact with other people how to make decisions 
So this whole uh, aspect of unstructured time, no, that you give, leave them time, let them invent their own games, let them make their own rules, let them uh, uh, engage in conflict and find how to resolve conflict, how to engage with all the things that come up when human beings function together. When they learn this young, you know, they have they develop this muscle to engage with all this. But instead, you say this is knowledge, <laughs> and you learn it by memorizing. and leave all this rich stuff of living alone yeah you're making handicapped human beings <laughs> you know despite this that we have all emerged is a different story but when you actually allow for life processes to be learned by engaging totally different beings come and i see this happening now just on the last 10 15 years of engaging like this totally different beings who have the ability to connect to themselves to express to engage in a in a very uh, uh, what shall we say uh, cooperative and inclusive way whether or not these binaries are not strong like you know so different uh, and you know, set up like ours where children from different backgrounds together and realizing that different people have different strengths you know and valuing that you know that somebody is very good at uh, Uh, being able to remember numbers or crunching numbers or whatever, and then somebody else is very good at identifying plants or working with soil or with their bodies or whatever. So each of them have their own uh, space, and that everybody is equal in that sense. Like you know, so that breaks uh, something. You know, that's also fascinating. So I mean, I feel here is a rich field which we are just beginning to scratch, and so I would come. completely redesign education i would completely look at it in a different way and i feel this whole model has to be <laughs> thrown away entirely like you know and then we have a possibility of maybe a new <laughs> a new different engagement like you watch you know jamal is bayangar exciting ah irukku the over space of over nimisham undu ad one space ni udada you know na vera teacher da panina nipadanga pas avanga avanga kelunga adigana mari and it's coming alive you know um, it's nice